Good afternoon. I'm Elisa Lagama, curator of African art in the Department of the Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas here. I want to welcome you this afternoon to a special program on the occasion of heroic Africans, legendary leaders, iconic sculptures. In his classic 1939 tribute to what had been an invisible segment of American society, the journalist James Agee concludes with the words of Ecclesiastes, Apocrypha, Sirach, chapter 44. I read them because they resonate with the content addressed by the current exhibition devoted to heroic Africans. Let us now praise famous men and our fathers that begat us. The Lord hath wrought great glory by them through his great power from the beginning. Such as did bear in their kingdoms, men renowned for their power, giving counsel by their understanding and declaring prophecies. Leaders of the people by their counsels and by their knowledge of learning, meet for the people, wise and, and eloquent, and their instructions. Rich men furnished with ability, living peaceably in their habitations. All these were honored in their generations and were the glory of their times. There be of them that have left a name behind them, and their praises might be reported. And some there be which have no memorial, who are perished as though they had never been, and are become as though they had never been born, and their children after them. Their bodies are buried in peace, but their name liveth forevermore. Heroic Africans reveals the significance of what are recognized as great sculptural achievements, conceived as enduring landmarks by the most gifted artists active in eight major artistic centers across the subcontinent that are highlighted on this map and that are presented in the body of the exhibition. The impetus for their creation was the desire to play tribute to celebrated men and women of those societies. Whenever possible, the exhibition reintroduces familiar icons of African sculpture in terms of a one-to-one -one connection with the individual life that sparked its creation. By doing so, we can more clearly comprehend their intention to physically make present those departed individuals who played a role in shaping the history of their people. This allowed them to remain vividly alive in the collective imagination of later generations. We all know about the exploits of larger-than-life figures from ancient familiar cultures whose achievements have come down to us in recorded history and who have inspired artistic representations. Among them are Nefertiti, chief consort to the Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten, Alexander III of Macedon, who built an empire extending from the Ionian Sea to the Himalayas by the age of 30, and Mongol Emperor Genghis Khan, who united the nomadic tribes of Northeast Asia. In contrast, African leaders of far more recent vintage are not at all familiar. Furthermore, their association with major works of art is seldom emphasized. I would wager that few among you are familiar with Idia, mother and advisor to the 16th century King of Benin, Assigie, who presided over the flowering of diplomatic and trade relations with Europe. Her wisdom and counsel led to her being immortalized in this ivory pendant mask, recognized as a great icon of African sculpture. Similarly, although you've heard of Alexander the Great, you're unlikely to know about Shyam the Great, a cosmopolitan visionary who introduced unprecedented innovations to his multi-ethnic constituency during the early, 20th, the early 17th century and united them within the Kuba state in the western Kasai region of what is today the Congo. Likewise, few of us outside of Cameroon Cameroon, know of Tuifon, fifth ruler of Qom during the mid-19th century. 
Tuifon is remembered for the fact that he at once safeguarded the territorial integrity of his confederacy of chiefdoms within the grass fields, assured its economic prosperity, and contributed to its artistic legacy as a sculptor. Why is it that for the most part we understand Sub-Saharan Africa's heritage in such depersonalized and generic terms? Art critic Peter Sheldahl has written that the last lack of graspable stories is what has made African art largely impenetrable to non-specialists. Since Africa's pre-colonial heroes were mainly remembered in oral histories rather than written accounts, their accomplishments have inexorably faded. Those narratives of individual protagonists were a casualty of the collision of cultures at the end of the 19th century. At that time, histories that had been relayed by word of mouth for centuries through elaborate recitations were disrupted by European colonialism. The defining role of those fragile oral narratives is the subject of a discussion featuring historian Joseph Miller, author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, and journalist and White House correspondent for the New York Times, Helene Cooper, that will mark the final Sunday of the exhibition on January 29th that I hope you'll all be able to attend. Spoken elegies to notable men and women often also inspired sculptural representations as concrete points of reference. When such artistic landmarks were ripped from their original context during colonialism, they lost their meaning. No longer were they understood to be specific protagonists, recognized for their contributions to their respective societies. Instead, they were viewed ahistorically as abstract depictions associated with broader cultural entities. This loss of our ability to identify the specific subjects of particular works is especially poignant given that in those instances when the achievements of the men and women depicted were otherwise unrecorded, the sculpture is the only surviving trace of their existence. What is common to the individuals commemorated by works and heroic Africans, like their counterparts throughout history and around the globe, is that they consciously sought to aggrandize and idealize their reputation for prosperity, for, for posterity, sorry. The sculptural works associated with them played a central role in that process. For this reason, while the New York Times art critic Colin Cotter described the works as what leaders look like, I would modify that heading slightly to what, leader, what leaders want to look like. It's important to keep in mind that the works and all the case studies presented in the exhibition depict men and women who were far from ordinary members of their societies each contributed to the shaping and articulating of a larger-than-life cultural ideal. Their depictions inspired reflection on what qualities future generations should aspire to embracing. While there are certain parallels across cultures, the visual language developed in each instance is distinct. And this afternoon's program focuses on a series of these with leading authorities on Ife, Cameroon Grassfields, and Chokwe and Lulua art. Close examination of the cluster of Ife works in Heroic Africans and those of the other sections of the exhibition provide an opportunity to open our eyes to the subtle adjustments that artists made to customize individual representations. The highly naturalistic approach to representation drawn upon by artists in 12th century Ife in what is present-day southwestern Nigeria highlights idealized attributes such as delicate almond-shaped eyes in concert with nuanced modeling of idiosyncratic facial structures. Exhaustive attention to detail is present in the exacting depiction of certain attributes of leadership. This is evident in the form of adenla, or elaborate beaded crowns that are the paramount sign of authority vested in Yoruba rulers and traced to Ife. 
When the king wears the adenla, his inner being is believed to become one with those of all his predecessors. Given that his destiny is conflated with that of this potent attribute, depictions of crowned leaders appear to have presented artists with an opportunity to represent their exalted subjects with specificity and expansiveness. Suzanne Blier, the Alan White Hill Clouds Professor of Fine Arts and of African American and African American Studies at Harvard University will address significant dimensions of Ife's art in greater detail in her talk that follows. Ife artists are credited with important developments in the art of their neighbors in the Kingdom of Benin. According to Benin historian J.U. Egevrebba in the late 14th century, the fifth Oba of the Oran Mian dynasty, Ogula, requested that the Oni of Ife send a brass caster to his court. Over the course of the 15th century, that technology and expertise was drawn upon to develop a genre of freestanding cast brass heads that celebrated individual Benin kings. Such commemorative portraits were commissioned by the firstborn son and successor of a deceased king to be positioned on an altar devoted to his father's memory. And on the left, you can see uh, the, an image of the ancestral altar at the palace, um, an ancestral altar at the palace of Benin in May of 1891 before the British um, invaded the palace and um, conquered Benin City. And on the right is a 1970 photograph of ancestral altars of Oba Overanmwen and Aweka II, um, taken at the court by the American photographer Elliot Ellisoffen. Oral traditions acknowledge that from the outset, a premium was placed on the depiction of kings of Benin as vigorously youthful leaders in their prime. Through those highly idealized representations, successive members of the dynasty intentionally blurred generational boundaries to reinforce ideas of familial succession. They did so by emphasizing a pictorial parallelism across generations. Once such works were removed from their original altars by the British in 1897, however, they ceased to be discussed in relation to individual leaders. And on the left is a portrait, a photographic portrait of Oba Ovranmanwen, who was deposed in 1897 by the British and sent into exile. And on the right is a 16th century Benin head that you see at the entrance of the exhibition in the Metropolitan's collection today. Instead, art historians have focused on proposing a chronology that addresses stylistic changes over time. According to that approach, these two works reflect formal adjustments that were introduced over the course of a century. The one on the left in the Metropolitan's collection is associated with aesthetic preferences of the 16th century. These favored a lighter casting to conserve the use of what were difficult to obtain and costly metals, and an emphasis on the full rounded contours of the subject's physiognomy. The work on the right has been attributed to the 17th century, a period of greater access to metals imported through trade with Europe. In response, royal patrons commissioned heavier, more robust sculptures. These cylindrical forms emphasize more elaborate beaded crowns and collars that frame and tightly circumscribe a panel of facial features. Rather than conceive of these works as generic likenesses of leaders linked to certain periods, however, I would suggest relating them to relevant names cited in Benin kingship chronologies. During the early 15th to the mid 16th century interval associated with the earlier head on the left, 10 different obas reigned beginning with Ohen and ending with Orhuegba. The later head on the right relates to the period associated with a time span of 11 reigns, extending from Egenbunda to Akenzua I. At least as far back as 1600, Akan elites in centers across south-central Ghana 
we're commissioning a richly diverse corpus of terracotta markers from female artists. Such creations were subsequently the visual focal point of celebrations that ushered the passage of those individuals into a parallel realm of existence. Their new status as ancestors was established through the ceremonial deposition of the terracotta effigy and an, at an exposed commemorative site. And you see two of those in historical documents on the screen. The one on the left is uh, located at Kwahu, and the one at the right in Angona. Uh, both of these images date from the 19th century. And these are works um, from the centers of Kwahu on the left and Eowyn on the right. Through comparing the formal approach favored by artists in these two centers, one gets a sense of the immense variety in artistic interpretations of this genre. The spirit of the subject, once deceased, is invoked into the bodily elemental Kwahu creations through prayer. These interpret the head as a flattened disc with features articulated in relief gazing heavenward. That two-dimensional rendering of a high forehead references the aesthetic ideal that a Khan mothers seek to achieve through massaging the heads of their infants in order to perfect the appearance of their children. A very different aesthetic defines a work documented from a ceremonial deposit at Nkwanta that you see on the right. It is identified with a Fukua, chiefly successor and daughter of Nana Atabra, the 18th century female leader of an Eowyn center in Western Ghana. A Fukua engages us directly and with penetrating intensity. Her likeness is striking for the dramatic purity of the egg-like form of her volumetric head subdivided by a strong horizontal brow. In a Khan culture, the egg is a metaphor for transformation from one state to another and the fragility of both life and power. A celebrated proverb states that, quote, power is like an egg. When held too loosely, it drops. Held too strongly, it collapses. Although it is likely that sculpture in wood goes back hundreds of years in Sub-Saharan Africa, given its greater vulnerability, works dating from before the 18th century have generally not survived. The degree of complexity and the stylistic diversity of those earliest preserved examples suggests that they relate to traditions developed over many, many generations. The Cameroon grass fields, the subject of Chris Geary's talk this afternoon, she's uh, joining us as the William Teal Curator of African and Oceanic Art at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Um, and the area that she's going to be focusing on was the site of hundreds of distinct polities governed by individual leaders who are major patrons of regional artists. In many of these, the chief commissioned a representation of himself to pass on to his successor. Stored within a palace shrine, the principal opportunity to view such works was occasions like the one you see on the screen when a new leader was installed. And here you see Hinabo the I of Kham at his installation ceremony in 1976. In order to provide you with a sense of how different grass fields chiefdoms customize such sculptural genres of royal representation, a series of works created for those leaders during the first half of the 19th century by the region's most gifted master sculptors are a focal point of heroic Africans. The one on the left has been attributed to the master of the Berlin Tani Commissioned by a Bangwa chief in Western Cameroon, that individual is depicted as a commanding figure gazing intensely forward, seated on a ceremonial seat of office, and holding a calabash vessel for palm wine. The dense surface patina of applied matter consists of libations directed toward this leader by successive generations of his family to induce him to remain engaged with their ongoing concerns. 
The anointment of the sculpture parallels that of the actual body of Grassfield's leaders over the course of rites of initiation that fortify them so that they may confront the challenges of their office. On the right is a work commissioned by Nguyen, the ruler of the Northwestern Kingdom of Kong from 1825 until 1840, a capable individual who at once expanded the scope of his territory and unified his constituents. Now in Frankfurt, it belongs to a highly original sculptural genre of the leader as a life-size sentinel-like figure who stands erect as the extension of a ceremonial seat of office situated at the base. The vitality of Enquain's presence has been underscored by the artist through the application of copper to the surface of his face to suggest skin tone, as well as real hair to the area of the headdress. In his talk this afternoon, Konstantin Petridis, curator of African art at the Cleveland Museum of Art, will focus on the traditions represented in the Chukwe and Lulua sections with the abolition of the slave trade in 1830, a major economic realignment occurred in Central Africa. A sudden shift to European demand for ivory and rubber allowed the Chukwe of present-day Angola and the DRC, as well as their Lulua neighbors, to channel their strengths as formidable hunters toward highly lucrative ends. The affluence they accrued was translated into the patronage of great artistic tributes that complemented their sense of confidence. The works that resulted are figures poised to spring into action. The attention to detail of extensive gear and weaponry, the definition of every joint of the exaggerated hands and feet of Chukwe leaders, and the elaborate customized body decoration of Lulua leopard chiefs underscores the take charge identity of leaders who proactively grasp control of their territorial resources. Those highly animated and physically dynamic tributes from Angola and Congo are in dramatic contrast to the tranquil meditative Ndup tradition sponsored by Kuba kings in the Western Kasai region. Each of those leaders is portrayed as a corpulent figure seated on a dais with legs crossed, eyes closed. As with the Benin altar heads, the pronounced formal parallelism that powerfully unites individual depictions serves to underscore the kinship of each member of the dynasty with its 17th century founder, Shyam, seen on the left. As the artistic surrogate of an individual leader, each of these works was an original variation on an established theme, customized by a visual signifier identified with its subject's reign. That emblematic motif, or ebol, is positioned at the front of the base. The figures were so intimately associated with their namesakes that they were handled as the person himself in when the, that leader was absent from the court. According to oral traditions, the prototype upon which all subsequent Kuba leaders defined their own depictions is that of, of Shyam on the left that is on loan to us from the British Museum. At the beginning of the 20th century, Shyam's descendant, the Kuba king Kota Pe, quoted his venerated ancestor's words concerning the, the intent of that prototypical representation. Quote, when they look at this statue, they will be able to remember me and think I am looking at them, consoling them when they are sad, giving them inspiration and new courage. The son of a Bouchong slave woman, Shyam rose from the humblest of origins to become a larger than life culture hero. His greatness was essentially informed by a cosmopolitanism developed through extensive travel that exposed him to ingenious developments abroad. In 1630, when he assumed leadership of a multi-ethnic confederation of chiefdoms, his introduction of new ideas fostered unparalleled innovation and prosperity. Among these uh, associated with his reign 
range uh, from city planning to the Leyel game board that he selected as his own e-ball that you see at the front of his depiction. His ascent to power coincided with a shift to agricultural production of millet and sorghum that also came to embrace new crops such as maize, tobacco, and beans. During the golden age of Shyam, metalsmiths, weavers, and carvers flourished under his patronage. His creative spark is inextricably associated with the Indop genre that he is credited with introducing in 1650. By the 18th century, however, the major rite of transition at the Cuba court consisted of isolating the ascendant heir with the Indop sculpture of his late predecessor, whose royal mana, or life force, was imbued within the figure. Creativity was the quality consistently valorized as an essential aspect of, a set of successful leadership among members of the Shyam dynasty. The work on the right identified with Mbo Peleng Anis, who reigned circa 1765, features an anvil as his ebol, in keeping with that emphasis. Mbo Peleng confronted the challenge of dissipating divisive ethnic affiliations among his people by abolishing the veneration of different regional spirits. It's likely that he replaced these with a new ancestor cult that focused veneration on the person of the king himself. Scholars reassessing this tradition have thus proposed that it developed during this period in relation to the emphasis on the king's person as the focus of devotion, and that even the work depicting Shyam, in fact, dates to this later period. It is noteworthy that during the 1900 visit to the Cuba court by Hungarian ethnographer Emil Tordé, the heirs to that tradition and the person of King Kotape and his council determined that it would be appropriate for that landmark to be transferred to a secure place where it would be seen by people of all nations at the British Museum. Finally, if I were asked what the greatest achievement, indeed revelation of heroic Africans is, I would say the never before assemblage of a critical mass of Hemba works inspired by individual chiefs. In Hemba chiefdom situated in today's Democratic Republic of the Congo, in the former Katanga region, leaders petitioned influential ancestral members through prayers directed to sculptural tributes, such as the one that you see on the screen. The 22 examples of these princely figures gathered together in the finale of the exhibition rank among the most sublime creations in the history of art. In pre-colonial Hemba society, the eldest among a chief's brothers and cousins became his successor at the time of his death. A chief's installation elevated him to a position of leadership endowed with spiritual authority as well. In that capacity, he served at once as the representative of the ancestors who had claim to a particular territory and who were literally absorbed within the earth. Past Hemba chiefs acted as guardians to their living inhabitants. Their successor inherited a series of works identified with, by name with influential predecessors. These embodied a charter of their owner's kinship system and were conserved in a structure centrally positioned within the community adjacent to the chief's residence. Over time, additional works were commissioned in response to unique visions, sometimes communicated in dreams. In these representations, Hemba leaders were greatly idealized as physically commanding and judicious figures. Their perfect verticality suggests supreme stability. Bodily passages of the head and torso were emphasized through the focal points of the eye and navel. These features underscored the primacy of the gaze as the sense through which one acquires knowledge and the umbilicus as the epicenter through which generations of leaders 
share the same lineage and are connected. Among the examples highlighted in Heroic Africans is a figure recorded as Kalalalea, a celebrated chief of the Kitunga clan from a village north of Mubula. The depiction is impressive for its scale and quiet power and is crowned by a spherical head defined by strong, perfectly balanced features. Smaller in scale uh, on the left, but striking for its expressive intensity, is this work that pays tribute to the chief Kalala Luhembwe from the, uh, the Kitinga region. And uh, these two works are examples of uh, the oeuvre of an individual whose hand has been identified um, as the Wuli master or um, master of Kateba. Uh, the, once again, in reflecting on the the significance of the works that we've brought together in this exhibition. Um, the thing that I think is so important for us to, to appreciate is that these are monuments that physically connected people from later generations to leaders who they appealed to for intercession on an ongoing basis. And, uh, look to as role models for shaping future behavior and, um, and conduct. The, the works in this exhibition um, are larger than life. They perfect the being of the individuals depicted. Um, they're not literal representations. They are celebrations of what those leaders aspired to be and the model that they leave uh, for future generations to, um, to embrace. And now we're going to be moving to the Cameroon grass fields. And please join me in welcoming Chris Geary, who's the William Teal Curator of uh, Oceanic and African Art at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here and speak on occasion of this wonderful exhibition, Heroic Africans, that I've seen by now about three or four times. It is absolutely filled with exquisite works from all over Africa and particularly from the Cameroon grass fields. Let me start with a personal note. When I first arrived in the small kingdom of Wei, you see a photograph here that shows this tiny little kingdom on the northern periphery of the grass fields to do anthropological work, I was very soon astounded to find out that there was a delegation from another kingdom coming by, namely from the kingdom of Bu, which was even smaller. And the chief of Bu actually invited me to work in his kingdom. I was at the time very young, an anthropologist, and I thought, now this is rather bizarre because, uh, you know, ways what I have chosen, and I declined the invitation. I partly declined the invitation because the chief of Wei, Philip Bame, asked me to stay. And I thought maybe it's because he's my landlord. But it really has a direct connection to this particular lecture that I'm giving today because it talks about and speaks to the competition between different kingdoms in the region. So in fact, the kingdom of Wei was happy to have an anthropologist, whereas the people of Bu didn't have one, and that's why they sent the delegation. Now let us first look at the grass fields as an ecumene, that is a region of constant interchanges. And I will hope I don't bother you too much with the map, which is here, which is actually the map that's in the exhibition catalog. And what it shows you is that the grass fields is a mountainous highland region in the west of Cameroon. It is the home to some 150 kingdoms, which ranged in size from a few hundred inhabitants to 60,000 at the end of the 19th century. 
the region's many states with di distinct identities have been divided into three groups, and you see that here on the map, according to similarities, shared histories, and geography. Oops, I didn't want to go. Let me go back. You see the Bamileke region right here, the Northwest province, which is the area I'm going to talk about in my lecture today. And I inserted some of the small kingdoms where I worked. You see Wei here, Fu, and you see Bali Nyonga. Those are some of the major places that I'm addressing today. Kingdoms to the south, among those of the Bangwa, are known as Bamileke. The largest state in the grass fields is Bamum, which you see on the right-hand side, located to the east, and this forms the third area. By the end of the 19th century, much of the grass fields came under German colonial rule, which deeply and at times tragically influenced the political situation. As we will see, it also affected the arts. At the beginning of the 20th century, Grassfield kingdoms and their kings, with the exception of some smaller peripheral units, were versions of the same pan-regional model and shared similar political structure and institutions. And you hear, here you see a postcard from the 1930s showing a king in one of the kingdoms around the Zhang area. They combined populations of diverse origins, among them the first inhabitants of the territory, migrants of different ethnicities, conquered peoples, and captives under the leadership of a head referred to as Fon, Foin, Foi, Fontem, or Batum, translated as king and chief in literature. These monarchs have sacred attributes, assure the well-being of the land and people, and stand at the apex of intricate systems of royals, noble retainers, ranked subchiefs, ordinary people, and in pre-colonial times, slaves. Councils of um, elders play an important role, and they're the king's closest advisors. And nobles and royals are other parts of these important uh, kingdoms and in society in hierarchy. Other institutions are influential men's and women's associations, often referred to as secret societies, for their members share esoteric knowledge and possess ritual objects hidden from sight of non-members. Some of these associations are restricted to princes, others to nobles, yet others assemble wealthy men displaying their riches during public pageants. The most powerful ones counterbalance the king's supremacy, and here you actually see members of one of these societies in this particular image. As a result of this constant regional interaction over centuries, peoples, goods, prestige media, and ideas freely flowed through continuous exchanges among the inhabitants of the grass fields and even to their neighbors. The competition for territory, resources, and people, and for recognition was fierce. The emphasis on gaining prestige manifested itself in many ways, even in having an anthropologist, and also played out in the visual domain. In this presentation, I will briefly look at the ruler's many ways to achieve fame and glory through four distinct strategies. Kings as innovators, the constant striving to acquire and import prestige goods, the commissioning and even appropriating of famous artists, and kings who themselves became artists. Kings as innovators. The most famous innovator is probably King Joya of Bamum, who ruled from 1886 to 1933. Suffice to say here that he was constantly striving to bring prestigious things from the outside, be it in the realm of dress, and here you see him in a German-style military uniform that he had commissioned his tailors to produce particularly for him, or in architectural innovation. Here are some photographs, uh, early photographs of King Joya Pal in Joya's palace, one from 1906, and you see that the palace facade has these 
um, rather plain pillars which support the roof. And in 1908, King Joya actually traveled to the coast. He came through Bamileke country where you have these wonderfully carved figurative pillars. And he decided that this was for him, this was for his palace. He commissioned his artist and brought other artists to create the most out outstanding, interesting figurative pillars which you see here in the right-hand uh, photograph, which was taken in 1912. Among other things, he also invented a script. And so he has gone into the history of African kings and leaders as one of the most innovative ones. A second strategy was importing prestigious items. And I'll just show you some examples here. Among these items actually belonged secret societies and associations, which could be freely purchased and bought from neighboring kingdoms and from leaders who owned them, and could then be instituted in one's own kingdom. Here you see a photograph that I took in Wei, which shows Kweifo. This is one of these societies that the Wei quarter heads or section heads actually imported at the beginning of the 20th century, which not only included the paraphernalia and costumes, but also the mess. And of course, once they had received the license, it's, it's a bit like copyright, they were able to have their carvers create mess for this particular association. Other goods were quite important, prestigious items that chief, chiefs would use. Here you see the King Bali uh, of Bali Nyonga for Nyonga, and I just want you to focus on this particular bronze pipe that he's holding. Not that these pipes were actually produced in Bali Nyonga, but they were produced by prestigious workshops in the area, and so they were imported and circulated throughout the entire grass fields. Finally here, a display of beaded calabash, which was taken, a photograph taken in around 1912 in the Bamum Kingdom. And you see not only the accumulation, but you also see that some of these calabashes may have come from workshops which were in other parts of the region and which were known for their output and whose wares circulated widely throughout the grass fields. Commissioning artists. Of course, there were many artists who acquired fame and reputation in the grass fields, and their reputation went way beyond the borders of the kingdoms in which they worked. So monarchs commissioned local artists to work exclusively for them, and they appropriated them, or they had workshops which worked entirely for the kingdom. Let me show you here the palace of King Wufa, Wufa of Babanki, a photograph which I took in the um, 1970s in front of his assembly house. And you see, on the one hand, you see pillars which resemble the ones that we saw in Bamum already, and there might well be sort of connection between him and Bamum. In, in fact, maybe the king of Babanki saw the pillars at the Bamum um, palace and created his own. So he had a workshop and artists working for him for many years. And of course, so did his predecessors. On the far side, another view of these pillars, clearly not all of them by the same hand, and on the near side, a detail of one of these pillars, which was probably created by a workshop in the 1940s or a little bit earlier. And here you see an outside photograph of one of these workshops, which I visited, and I want you to pay attention to the commemorative figures that have been carved, which consequently were actually traded to some of the other kingdoms and chiefdoms in the area, and of course in the 1970s also to important uh, family heads who had started their own grouping of commemorative figures of their ancestors and essentially of themselves. It's oftentimes very difficult to trace the identity of these artists, and at times such efforts can be very perplexing, as I found out when I worked on the exhibition and catalog Art in Cameroon Sculptural Dialogues, which was an exhibition shown at the New Burger Museum of Art from April to August this year. One of the most famous of these artists is a great master and his workshop who worked for Fontem Asongani, the king of Lebang, one of several Bangwa kingdoms better known in the literature as Bangwa Fontem. And here you see one of the few portraits we have, and the only portrait that I actually know 
of King um, Asongani, which was taken by what I think would be a local photographer in the 1940s, and it's also published in the wonderful catalog and book that Alisa Lagama put together for this exhibition. There are some 20 works that have been attributed to this important master, and many of them are actually here on display. His name is Atwe Atza, and he's showing his signature style in these pieces, which um, Alisa has so well delineated in the exhibition's catalog, and I urge you to read the chapter about the Cameron grass fields. This master has been, as I said, identified as Atwe Atza by Pierre Arter, a French medical doctor, collector, and scholar who devoted his life to the study of grass fields arts. According to Aitere's writings, King Defang, the eighth ruler of Lebang, in 1967 told him about a sculptor who worked for his father Asungani in the late 19th century. According to King Defang's story, King Fomen, the ruler of a neighboring kingdom, uh, the Banyang uh, people who were um, adjacent to the Bangwa, called this artist to his palace and commissioned him to carve his portrait. Rather than idealizing the sitter, as was customary in formal portraits, the sculpture rendered his unpleasant features, causing the king's ire. By the time the transgression came to light, the artist had returned to the safe haven of Lebang and his kingdom. Arte relates the carver's name, Atua Atza. He also showed photographs of his works to his Bangwa consultants, who confirmed this identification. The story about a master carver who offended a Banyan king was also recorded by Robert Brain, who did extensive field work in Bangwa in 1965. During a second stay of six months in 1967, he focused on artists, but never gave the sculpture's name. In fact, he photographed objects attributed to this anonymous artist, which do not share the stylistic characteristics with, with Atio Atza's sculptures. Perhaps this oral tradition, rather than referring to a particular artist, was meant to diminish the Banyang kings, who did not live up to the sophistication of the Bangwa rulers and could be tricked by a carver. The Atua Atza mystery deepened when I recently contacted Reverend Father Michael Lockhart, who works in the Bangwa region and maintains a website on the Bangwa kingdoms with his Bangwa friends. And here you see another figure. This one is in the collection of the Newburger Museum of Art and also attributed to this carver. When I asked Father Lockhart, and I called him in Scotland, that's where he lived, whether the name Atua Atza sounded familiar, his first reaction was, it doesn't sound Bangwa to me at all. He in turn got in touch with Awuncha Michael Tintui, who served as the personal secretary of King Defang, who had talked to Pierre Arter over 30 years of his reign. Mr. Arungacha recalled the name Efrud Lacha, a famous carver who worked at the beginning of the 20th century. Is Atwe Atza then Atea's misrendering of Edward Lacha, or is it the artist's nickname, since nicknames are common? Does the name refer to a different master carver? It is certainly a question of time having passed by, and um, memory may fade and things may be forgotten. Ultimately, we will never know the answer, but both names should be considered a reference to a master and his workshop which existed from 1840 well into the 20th century. Artists' kings, and that's one of the most interesting developments in the Cameroon grass fields. Among the most interesting strategies of competing is the role that kings themselves played on cre in creating sculpture programs and, a work and workshops that gave visual expression to the nature of their kingship and the power of the kingdom and garnered them prestige throughout the grass fields. Among them was King Fonchu Asse, who ruled from 1908 to 1919, of the, the Kedjim Tingung Kingdom, which we better, better know as Babanki uh, Tungo in art historic literature. He excelled as a carver. He is in the company of other artists' kings, such as Von Yu of Kom and several rulers of the kingdom of Babungo. 
1913, a German Catholic missioner, Father Johannes Emons, visited King von Choisse in his palace workshop and writes, and I quote, he is obviously pleased that a white person shows interest in his art. He explains the type of wood of different works, the necessity to use only dry wood or else the completed carvings would crack, about the prices one pays him and the customers who are recipients, about the time he has taken for his works, etc. He has learned the art of carving from his father, who, however, mostly engaged in carving masks. He always observed him and helped when the same one died. He initially carved masks, human, elephant, and bird masks, and all other dance masks known in the area. In the long run, that was too simple and boring for him. And when he once saw a magnificent wooden throne with all kinds of figures at the Bamum chief's place in Fumban, he decided to carve one, he decided to carve similar ones for great patrons and chiefs only. This brought him and his tribe honor, and, the other old, and after the old chief's death, he was chosen to be his successor. So the point here is the creativity that resides in these uh, wonderful leaders in the grass fields. Heyman's observations, and you see a portrait of him, of course, there on uh, both portraits taken at the beginning of the 20th century, Amon's observations cast an interesting light on the way in which ideas and objects circulated. A visit to Bamum persuaded the king to focus on what one would consider today high-end customers, and he drew inspiration from his encounter with royal arts in Bamum. Now, in the photograph that you see on the um, far side, Foncho Asse carves a stool with a back, a feature also encountered in thrones created by Bamum artists in the first and second decade of the 20th century. In addition, the backs echo European chairs, which arrived in the region during the last decades of the 19th century. And here you see, of course, the famous two-figure throne in uh, the kingdom of Bamum that served as an inspiration to a number of carvers in the Grassfields region. Did the pillars with superimposed figures that we have seen at the Bamum Palace and in Babanki, uh, the other Babanki, B Big Babanki, such as the one on the uh, far side, did they inspire carvers such as um, the one Fontuase in, in Babanki Tungo to create his own? This one is, of course, a piece that has been attributed to his hand. It is interesting to note that Amons does not mention carved pillars in his extensive account about Fontuase's palace. Rather, he praises the arrangements of his chief's place and the form of the houses and groups of houses, demonstrating that he has more taste for daintiness and originality than many other chiefs in the vicinity. This fragment of a figurative post once graced the Babanki Tungo Palace and um, may be, of course, and has been attributed to his workshop. According to Amons, the king had, and I quote, servants who are ready for all kinds of assistance. Upon request, they hand the appropriate tools and help with the larger works, are also at the same time the art students to whom the spirit of the master will be passed on. Now, you see another photograph from the 1930s that shows a very similar pillar which has been attributed to this master carver and king. Let me move on to the kingdom of Combe and, of course, to some of the pieces that are dis uh, displayed in, in the exhibition outside. Now, there is a very interesting history that's connected with the um, figures and with the Combe kingdom. The kingdom of Combe Bafut and Bang, uh, Bandeng resisted after the Germans established a military station in Bambenda in 1901, and of course they were avid collectors, as you can see in this photograph. This is an image taken around 1904 outside of the house of the station commander, and here, look at the posts right here. Look at the chairs that he collected, and this is probably um, Hans Glauning, who was the commander at this particular time period. Now, in 1901, 
the um, Germans attacked the kingdom of Bafut and, and um, essentially destroyed it. After this show of force, King Yu of Qom accommodated German requests for labor and goods, but in early November 1904, according to German archival records, Bamenda Station received information that Qom was readying to attack. On November 13, 1904, an expedition consisting of a German officer by the name of Hans Edler from Putlitz, a military doctor, a sergeant, and 70 African troops attacked and ultimately defeated the kingdom. Among the spoils were the two famous commemorative thrones that you see in this exhibition. They were carved by an unidentified master carver of the 19th century and said to portray King Tufoin, who ruled from 1840 to 1855, and Queen Mother Naya, and they are now part of the collection of the Ethnologisches Museum in Berlin. They are among the most stunning works in this exhibition. They're life-size, and uh, they're connected to this very interesting uh, history and sad history in a way. Let me show you a photograph that refers to the collection of these two pieces and is also actually in the catalog. Here you have the Germans proudly sitting with the um, objects that they confiscated in the Korn Palace. It's interesting to note the, the um, caption on this one. It says actually carved fetish images. And of course you see the two pieces here that are outside on display. And you see a number of other images. Um, this one is originally a lantern slide. Uh, and I think that's the only version in which, which it ex exists. And that's you know what we have been using and what I have been using um, for a while are actually, is actually a cropped uh, version of this particular slide. Now here we see that other pieces, and I marked them in red, actually were in the group of objects that left Com at this particular point in time in 2005. And some of them are now in the Linden Museum in Stuttgart. Von Putlitz donated um, especially this particular object here in the middle and, and some of the other works such as the mass to Stuttgart because um, he sort of did not honor the agreement or, and actually the, the regulation that military personnel had to donate all pieces to the Berlin Museum. Stuttgart was his hometown, his home state. And the question that arises is here, were these, for instance, objects that were carved by Fon Yu, who was a famous carver and who had trained as a carver before he actually became king of Qom in the neighboring small kingdom of Bambui and then become an accomplished sculptor? I just want you to, again, pay attention to this middle figure. This is what it looks, it, it looks like now in the Linden Museum. And what is interesting about this particular piece that is actually, it seems either unfinished or it seems in the, in the process of being redone. In other words, maybe the beads have been removed. It has a copper overlay uh, for the face. Um, let me go back here. It wears a European style hat, which indicates that maybe it was made at the, um, you know, uh, after the Germans had arrived in the Cameron Crossfields, um, and it could very well be a work of von Yu, the famous carver. It has, it had um, cloth attached down here, which has been removed by the conservators of the Linden Museum, no doubt, and it has copper overlay and a very um, rather awkward smiling or almost grinning face. Well, let's look at the workshop of on you. We have this incredible series of photographs which were taken by Adolf Diehl, a German colonial agent, um, collector who collected for several museums, uh, probably in 1911, showing King Yu in the palace in his workshop. And what I find interesting about this picture, you have the unfinished works here in the background, and you have another carver in the image, which means that he had assistants, associates, and of course, Alisa mentions one of these in her essay about the uh, Com Kingdom and King, King, Yu, uh, King Yu. Now, there are more 
photographs in this series. So you have a close-up of the king. Um, he was quite elderly. He died a year later. He is, he is holding an adz, and you see, I want to uh, draw your attention to this particular... I always push the wrong button somehow. <laughs> to this particular figure right here, which actually is still in the Korn Palace. And then I want to draw your attention to this image right here. Uh, this is taken in Etui, which is the um, central stone throne in the uh, Korn Palace. And if you look very carefully, here you see African helpers of Adolf Diehl packing up works from the workshop. If you look at it, you see, you see boxes. Somebody's packing something here. Here you see something that's already wrapped up. The question that we ask is why were they let go? Many of the works traveled abroad. Others remained in the Com treasury. Were they let go because they had lost in importance? Were they let go because Comb and Von Yu actually also worked for the market? So we have uh, the market of the nas nascent colonial market and of course for other kings. So we have a number of interesting questions that are associated with kings as carvers, as patrons, as producers, kings as creative individuals. And here you see the one figure that has remained of this corpus in the Comb Palace, and I have inserted it here into this photograph which was taken by Louis Perrois in 1984, and is actually also in the palace. It's, it's this particular piece here that was then beaded, and of course, von Yu was also an excellent, excellent bead worker, um, as we know from early reports. Moving on to Babungo another kingdom. There's a long tradition of kings as carvers, and I refer here to the work, work of Jean-Paul Notui, who is a um, Cameroonian um, art historian, who has done a study of the um, works in the, Bamun Pal in, in the Babungo Palace Museum. And here you see King Sangi of Babungo, who ruled until 1928. And I want you to draw your att uh, pay attention to this particular image right here. This exhibition has a wonderful photographic component of kings presenting themselves in um, photographic portraits, and there's one of the earliest uh, um, no, um, no, um, fig figures showing us how they actually used images that circulated in the grass fields. Very quickly, let me go through the works that have been attributed to the, these kings, which actually uh, relate and commemorate their um, predecessors and ancestors. Here you have a work by King Sake II, who was the successor of King Sangi of Babungo, which shows his um, predecessor. And here you finally have a two-figure throne, which was done by King Zofoa II of Babungo, who ruled until 1999 and is clearly modeled on the um, Bamum two-figure thrones that you see depicted in the postcard on the far side. I actually almost thought I would work in Babungo, but then I was told that the king was really a ladies' man, and I was only 24 years old at the time, and that sort of made me hesitate to work with him. I wish I had, because I think it would have been really, really interesting. Now let me quickly conclude with a, a case study that is really fascinating. I've talked about the different ways that kings had developed strategies to compete in the area of the grass fields and to make themselves known and accumulate glory and fame through the means of visual expression. The Bali Nyonga Kingdom, which you see here in a 1908 photograph, is an interesting case in point. What we have here is an expansionist state which was actually founded only in the 19th century, not far from uh, Bamenda. And it was founded by Chamba peoples who had come from Nigeria, present-day Nigeria, to the north of the border of Cameroon. The Chamba migrants who founded Bali Nyonga in the early 19th century established their rule through constant expansion and warfare. They came actually from the Benue River Valley. Although they had and maintained to an extent their own visual traditions, they began to adapt and to adopt the architectural and sculptural forms that would make them an integral part 
of the grass fields and that would make them able to participate in the prestige economy of the grass fields in visual terms. Here you see King von Yonga of Bali, Nyonga, and one of his wives in 1906, and you see all the imports that he's actually using. So if you go through the photographic record, you'll see that he, as much as King Joya, adopted and adapted forms that came to his attention. And wouldn't you know it, it turns out that the first king of the Bali um, Nyonga kingdom who was the one who established claim and fame of this polity, also worked as a carver and bead um, worker. And here you see a photograph from the um, early 20th century showing, as we would expect, let me go back here, another two-figure throne. In this particular case, it is modeled on the Bamum one, I would think. It's beaded. It sits on a leopard carotid, and you have the male figure holding a, holding a drinking horn for libations, and you have what could be another male figure in this particular case holding a severed head, which alludes to the expansion and the bellicose nature of the Bali Nyonga state. You have two more figures that have been attributed to King Gailega of um, Bali Nyonga, and you have other accumulated things. You have what I think is a gramophone right here, you have an ivory tusk. So you have a whole array of objects and things that were part of the grass fields um, habitus, the way kings expressed that they were part of the grass fields. You have the palace, and I want you to pay attention to the palace entrance right here. And carved pillars, as you would have seen in other parts of the grass fields among the Bamileke. Um, you have imported cloth from Bukhari, which is in present-day Nigeria. You have the insides of the palace, which were um, adorned with uh, figurative carvings and relief carvings. And you have royal emblems, as in this case, for instance, the fly whisk and a royal necklace, and then you have stools. And all of these probably came from, um, some of these came from areas around Bali. What is most interesting, though, is that the king of Bali appropriated artists. Here you see the king of the party. That's a group that came under, Bamum, uh, under Bali dominance. And actually, in this particular instance, asked for protection of the Bali Nyonga king. They were renowned artists. And you see the king, of course, sitting here uh, with a prestige pipe on his own throne. They were renowned artists, and they started to work for the Bali Nyonga kingdom. And they may very well have been the people who uh, created the interior of the palace that I just showed you, as well as a very important drinking um, assembly hall for um, one of the societies, which they adorned with pillars. There was another group of artists in, in the um, Bali community. These were the Bavok, which too had been come under Bali dominance. And here you see very likely some of their works, the works of the party in the, the Babok. Here you see King von, von Yonga standing in this 1912 image. And here you see the entire ensemble of this particular assembly house. Many of the posts are now in collections in Europe and the United States. So there is the third element that I talked about, the appropriation of the artists and the way of using their skills for the particular kingdoms. And here's one of the uh, details of one of these pillars, clearly in a style that would not be Bali Nyonga, but we would uh, delineate it as Bam Bamileke, by a Babok artist. Well, I have to come to the conclusion of my talk. And I want to end with this photograph that I took in the Baumung Kingdom in 2004. It shows the display of regalia of the Baumung to figure thrones. Here the king is sitting on the throne the um, emblems of his office, and it is the celebration of Bamum identity. And again, what we see here, so many years later, after these images were taken that I showed you in my talk, we see the way of how the prestige and the grandeur of the political, po excuse me, of political unit is actually reflected in 
these works of art that are put on display and that are there for prestige. Nowadays, the prestige is gained through television and through videotape. And it's still a competition in the visual domain, and it's still um, a way of creating one's own identity in the Cameroon grass fields and also in the Cameroonian state. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And I should say that uh, Chris Geary's comments um, can also be heard as part of the audio guide that goes along with um, Heroic Africans. Um, she discusses the um, portrait, the photographic portraits that are at the entrance to the exhibition. And our final speaker this afternoon is my colleague, Constantin Pedridis, who has joined us from the Cleveland Museum of Art, where he is curator for Africa and the author of many important uh, exhibition projects, uh, one of which focused on Chokwe and Lulua works that are presented in our current exhibition, and he'll be discussing those this afternoon. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And, uh, First of all, I'd like to thank the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Alisa Lagama in particular for uh, giving me the honor and privilege to speak to you today in conjunction with this uh, wonderful exhibition, Heroic Africans. Um, and I typically don't do this, but I've seen it done by some of my colleagues. I know that you've been sitting here for a while. If you, while I open the talk, want to stand up, stretch your legs, feel free to do so. I won't be offended at all. So um, I have the pleasure to talk to you um, about Lulua and Chokwe leadership arts, and I've titled the talk Powerful Men and Beautiful Women, but I could also have turned it around and called it um, I guess, handsome men and powerful women. Um, I'm talking about both these people uh, in one lecture because they actually have a lot in common. Um, their culture is indeed very similar, although artistically speaking, as you might have noticed if you walk through the exhibition, they're responsible for quite distinct uh, carving traditions. The Lulua people live in the present-day Democratic Republic of the Congo, in the south-central part of it. You see their a uh, habitat marked here, and the Chokwe people occupy a vast region, mainly in what is today Angola, but also in parts of the Congo, in several uh, regions of the Congo, and even here in Zambia. They've indeed had a very expansive uh, history. Now, Lulua people um, have been influenced in many ways by their Chokwe neighbors. Tobacco consumption and the carving of mortars to hold snuff tobacco are one example rubber exploitation, body decoration with all kinds of permanent marks, architectural elements, a puberty ritual for boys known as mukanda, but also a divination method uh, which uses a basket like it's illustrated in this image taken in Angola in 1956. Um, and then also certain mask forms um, have been introduced among the Lulua by the Chokwe people. And in fact, even the name Lulua, which basically refers to the river crossing the Lulua habitat, would have been introduced by the Chokwe in the latter part of the 19th century. Although there were earlier contacts between the two people, much of the influence of the Chokwe on the Lulua is attributed to the settlement in Lulua land of Mukwadianga and other important Chokwe chiefs in the second half of the 19th century. It is at that time that Chokwe hunters and traders looking for ivory, beeswax, and slaves immigrated in the region inhabited by the Lulua people. It appears that the confrontation with these Chokwe traders and the impact on the local economy um, also had an effect on Lulua's uh, social and political structure and organization. Specifically, at least in some parts of Lulua uh, territory, it created a social opposition between what one could call a class of noblemen or a nobility, and on the other hand, ordinary people of commoners. And then significant is that some ambitious chief among the Lulua people actually um, acquired wealth and firearms, and in doing so, they um, uh, 
in increase their power and they attempt to emulate, to copy the Chokwe example of a more centralized state by subjugating neighboring chiefs. Now, not many of them were very successful and never in the history of the Lulua people was there one chief who was able to take precedence over his political rivals. But there's one fellow who stands out and that's this guy shown in this engraving published in 1891, um, a, a chief called Kalamba Mukenge or Mukenge Kalamba of the Benakashia subgroup among the Lulua. He owed his fame and reputation in part to the alliances that he had forged with the Chokwe people and with other Angolan tradespeople, mainly middlemen, who traveled across this area. But he also uh, greatly benefited from the friendly diplomatic relationships he had established with German explorers, such, such as most notably Hermann von Wismann, um, who is actually the lead author of the book from which this image was taken and what penetrated the uh, Lulua region in the 1880s. It is against this um, specific social, political, and economic background of the final quarter of the 19th century that we have to situate some of the Lulua people's most refined sculptures. Sculptures that are characterized by a certain degree of naturalism and also a relatively large size, um, which would have belonged to this newly formed nobility. Originally, figure sculpture among the Lulua was focused on so-called power objects. And I'll go back or come back to that point a little bit later. They're locally known as manga or singular buanga. And these power objects are a, a type of object that is quite popular throughout Bantu-speaking Africa. And in, in essence, they refer to uh, containers or recipients, if you wish, for medicinal and magical substances which are endowed with uh, supernatural qualities and powers. But from the majority of power objects that existed initially in Lulua land, we see in that final quarter of the 19th century the development of something that um, becomes more and more uh, something that we would today call status or prestige arts. And it is against this evolution and this uh, specific uh, context that we have to look at this rare category of male figures, uh, chiefly figures of the Lulua, of which heroic Africans includes a handful of stellar examples. And in fact, the one that I'm showing you here is not part of what is on view. And that's also not the case for this example in a private collection. There's very few of them around. Um, they're, as I said, relatively large in size and scale, at least compared to the majority of other Lulua carvings that have been um, preserved. And these objects um, appear to have been the prerogative of high-ranking chiefs who um, were adepts of the Buanga Bua Bukalenga, and that's the name that you see spelled here. It includes that word Buanga, which is the local vernacular term for power object, and then Bua Bukalenga means the power objects of chieftaincy, of leadership. Bukalenga is simply the word for chief, or for sir, if you wish. So that's, uh, these objects are um, related to that Buanga Bua Bukalenga cult and the power objects that function in it, and and in the end, the purpose of this cult and of the power objects is to fortify the authority of the chief, to safeguard his well-being and that of his people, and to generally promote um, the ties that the chief um, entertains with the ancestors. And just uh, to be uh, clear from the um, outset, that word Buanga is the equivalent of a word that is used in many other parts of Central Africa, and Kisi or Nkishi, and we know it among many different people, and it refers to the same concept. Um, there's an, a female equivalent of these kind of male chiefly figures, of which Heroic Africans doesn't include an example, and there's very few of them that have been preserved, less than a handful. Um, one is this example, a field collected in 1884 by one of the travel companions of Hermann von Wismann, the man who uh, uh, f uh, at least uh, illustrated Kalem Kalamba Mukenge's portrait, and it's today also in the Ethnologisches Museum in Berlin. I mean also because you'll see many objects of, uh, that I will be showing you are housed in that particular institution. Now, these kind of objects belong to another kind of buanga, buanga buabwimpe, literally uh, power objects related to beauty, and they're specifically devoted to the protection of the health and the beauty of pale-skinned newborn children and their mothers, but a specific subcategory is identified by the larger scale 
45 centimeters and above, and the walking stick or staff that she holds in her right hand, and then also um, all the attributes that are added to the object that refer to charms or amulets, and that um, uh, in, in this case um, make it clear that we're dealing with the chief's eldest daughter who, who um, uh, was uh, inflicted by illness um, by a spirit and had to undergo a very complicated initiation process to be liberated or cured from this infliction. And as a result of that, she would assume the highest political powers and she would acquire that title in Abanza. And that's what I've written here. There's a few other examples known. The one on the left was, interestingly enough, collected by Leo Frobenius in 1905, today in Detroit. The one on the right, um, acquired much later by an art historian, a Belgian art historian, Paul Timmermans, in 1964 in a private collection. The uh, Lulua chiefly figures, um, uh, some of them at least, seem to have been uh, acquired with what appear to be proper names, names that indicate that they commemorated and belonged to individual historical leaders. And this is the case of at least two examples in another uh, important collection of this kind of material, um, Intervuren near Brussels, the Royal Museum of Central Africa in Belgium, um, one of which is called Ilunga Mukulu. The second one, the more famous one perhaps, is called Chibuabwa Ilunga. Those are honorary names that seem to have uh, belonged to specific historical leaders. Um, these objects were acquired in the um, early 1900s. Um, and of course, that phenomenon of having um, these kind of power objects, because that is what they ultimately are, related to proper names, is something that you also find among the Songhe people, a neighboring tradition, where you have their own local variety of power objects here known as an kishi. And here, too, these objects refer to legendary heroes and ancestors, and they portray in their imagery, and I will come back to that in a second, attributes that are proper um, to leaders and chiefs and that denote their high-ranking position and ultimately also the fact that they serve as living mediators between this world and the world of the spirits. This is one example. Um, uh, this is another example. Large monumental objects um, that are known under this generic name but sometimes also have particular proper names affiliated with them. This is an, uh, one of the Lulua chiefly figures included in the exhibition from a local collection here. Um, and what these images typically portray are, as I said, the highest rank of leadership. And um, that rank is identifiable through specific accessories in their dress and in their makeup, but also through general physical attributes. And one of the things that appears in many of these objects is the representation of very complex cicatrizations or scarification marks that are uh, uh, um, depicted mainly on the face, but also on the upper part of the body and um, the arms and sometimes the legs. And then there are also other attributes that are proper to that title and specifically or more imp most importantly a little apron or front skirt that imitates the pelt of a leopard or a related spotted uh, predator um, which identifies this particular chief as what the uh, Lulua people call Mukalenga Wan Kashama. And Kashama is the name for leopard and that's the, the highest political title in um, that part of Africa. And obviously the relationship between the leopard and, and, and the chief is something that is widespread throughout Central Africa and you'll also find it in many parts of the Cameroon grass fields. Um, the, the chief received this title after a lengthy and complicated initiation ritual after which he was believed to share some of the powers and um, force of the leopard. Um, other uh, identifying elements are the headgear, and there's many varieties of them. Many of them actually imitate European imported headgear that was uh, uh, quickly adopted and used by Lulua chiefs, but also um, the necks that are decorated with rows of blue and white beads, like the ones that you saw in one of these two Songhe figures, uh, beards that are elaborately dressed, plated, and sometimes with uh, beads um, added to them. Them, um, and then also a drinking horn that they carry over one of the shoulders. You see that in most of these examples. Here is an example, and you see it also 
I think if you look carefully, we can, I can't see it from here, um, in this Berlin uh, f uh, figure, which also holds a sword and, or double-edged sword and a shield in its hands, which indicates um, the fact that uh, uh, many of these chiefs um, uh, were successful um, in part uh, thanks to their reputation as warriors, so that warfare was one means, obviously, to gain uh, importance. Um, Quickly, this is a, a crouching figure similar to the one that you would see hung over or around the neck, like in the case of this Berlin Museum figure, um, a crouching figure that is in itself filled with uh, substances, in this case, in a small antelope horn that is stuck in top of the head and that would serve as an amulet or a charm and in a certain way um, be an, a power object in and by itself. This is actually um, not totally related to what I've just shown you. It's related to the hunt and it's an, an object that stands in and uh, by itself. The, there's obviously um, uh, formal uh, relationships, but also relationships in terms of meaning between the Lulua chiefly figures and those among the Chokwe. And there's a wide range of impressive Chokwe chiefly figures uh, united in the exhibition Heroic Africans. Um, it, although there's no historical or other documentation to prove this, it is not entirely impossible that Lulua artists found inspiration in the Chokwe sculpture tradition to create their leadership statuary. Chokwe figures is, as we will see, are, as we will see, uh, typically dated to the late 18th or early 19th century. Um, but what is, of course, striking in this case is the almost... Uh, uh, naked representation of the Chokwe chief with um, emphasis on the uh, of body features that are finely carved and that show great attention to anatomical details with especially an, um, an uh, exaggerated rendering of certain body parts such as the hands and the feet. Um, these are really idealized uh, representations of leadership and they also express a great uh, physical dynamism which is achieved through the uh, bending knees and also the very distinctive hand and arm gestures. In this case, the hands held together refer to a gesture known as tachi, which is a sign of power and strength. And some figures like this spectacular seated example on a folding chair, which was uh, introduced in Chokwe land uh, by the Portuguese, um, but so this figure shows this clapping gesture, which is a sign of welcoming, and, um, and in fact also serves as an act of benediction. It's called moyo, which basically means life among the Chokwe and the Lulua. Um, so I've pointed to the uh, outsized hands and feet, and very often the very articulated fingers and toes. Um, all these elements of anatomy express ideas of tireless endurance and the ability to overcome um, uh, all kinds of obstacles. Facial features are often rendered with extreme precision and articulation, and very often their lifelike quality is enhanced by the inlaid brass eyes, and often you'll also see beards that are made up of real human hair, as opposed to the sculptural imitation of these beards that we saw in the Lulua figures that I just showed you. Um, and of course, the most striking element of uh, regalia are the headdresses that are depicted on these chiefs, and they're typically two variations on one and the same type of object. They have their own name, and the one that is most common is this thing called chipenya mutwe, which in this image you see is sometimes, but not always, made out of metal. And that's an early photo dated from 1903, made by a Portuguese um, explorer uh, called Arturo da Fonseca Cardoso. Also, um, and it's, it, it, of course, because of the Portuguese presence in Angola that many of these great objects are found today in museums all over Portugal, and it's a special treat to be able to see them in reality and all together in heroic Africans. Very few of us have had that opportunity before. Now, aside from so-called normal chiefly figures, like the ones that I've shown you standing or seated, there are also a spectacular subcategory of chiefly figures, which are generally identified with the name Chibinda Ilunga. And it's on the basis of the attributes of these figures that we have um, uh, come up uh, with that identification. And it's thanks to the work of one Belgian art historian, Marie-Louise Bastin, who in 1956, during fieldwork in Angola, um, interviewed a local diviner and was able to propose this identification to this particular type of chiefly figures among the Chokwe. Now, they refer to an, an epic 
uh, a story about a culture hero called Chibinaulunga, who was actually a man coming from the east, from what is today Luba country, a Luba prince, who um, after peregrinations and migrations installed himself in the Lunda area, and Lunda are neighboring closely related peoples to the Chokwe, and ultimately the Lunda people who were at one point a large empire were subjugated by the Chokwe, and uh, when the Chokwe did that, they found inspiration in uh, some of the historical and mythical um, uh, uh, stories that had a camp accompanied um, or, or that were proper to the Lunda and they basically um, assimilated them and they gave shape to this culture hero, Chibinda Ilunga, in these types of images. A culture hero which um, is remembered in that epic story for his heroic actions um, and uh, also for his beautiful athletic appearance. And he's um, uh, uh, held responsible for the introduction in that region of uh, refined hunting techniques and also forms of political organization. And it is um, to him that the Chokwe people ascribe their uh, centralized uh, power um, as it was expressed in, uh, in the uh, shape of their local leaders called Mwanangana, and I'll repeat that term later. This is perhaps the most uh, famous of all these Chibinda Ilunga figures today at uh, the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth in Texas. Um, its collection history um, appears to go back before 1900, but we know nothing about when and by whom it was actually taken out of Angola, or at least not with certainty. But the object is really spectacular in um, expressing all these features that I've alluded to earlier. Um, uh, you see that uh, the, the, the great attention to the anatomy, um, the, 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 the facial features, the importance of the gaze. It's not just the posture as such, but it's also the gaze and the way um, uh, the, the hero is being portrayed in, 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 um, as, a, as an active human being that is so important. And then also this very elaborate uh, headdress. Um, and of course, here, more than in many other examples, the um, exaggerated hands and feet with a very detailed rendering of the nails on both hands and feet. And then the attributes that identify him as Chibinda Ilunga, but more importantly, as a hunter. You have a, a staff, um, and you also have a charm in the form of an antelope horn that is actually hollowed out and that uh, held some uh, substances. Um, the fact is that the hunting skills obviously contributed to the success that the Chokwe would have in their uh, trading activity and would, as a result of that, also contribute to their, um, their success in the trade, would contribute to their political supremacy. One of the very few images that we know from the 19th century um, in a book by Capello and Evans, 1882, where you see a hunter with a typical uh, flintlock musket or rifle that was introduced in that region in the 17th century and whose image you will, or uh, the image of which you will see in many of these Chibindailunga figures, most notably this example where the staff is combined with a musket rifle. That's an example in uh, the uh, I think the University of Porto Museum too, um, and it also has that striking beard of real human hair. And what is also interesting here is that in, in addition to these hunting accessories and attributes, there's these little figures, at least one of them has been preserved, carved on the basis of the object that would represent his uh, uh, spiritual aids. Um, there are images of spirits that would assist and guide him uh, during his uh, reign and specifically during uh, his uh, hunting activities. This is maybe uh, um, the, the most uh, often published and, and exhibited example from Berlin of this uh, Chibinda Ilunga figures, an object collected in 1878 by a man called Otto Schutt. Um, and here you see that there's not only a little figure carved on the basis, but also two of them on, his, on the side wings of his um, headdress. And then this very long beard, um, which is wrapped as it would have happened in real life um, with either uh, fibers or metal work. Um, what is also interesting here, you don't see it on this image, but he carries a number of attributes that again refer to his um, hunting um, activities, a dagger or knife, a cartridge pouch on the back, a powder flask, a protective charm, in this case in the form of a beautifully carved tortoise shell, 
Um, and uh, in this case, actually, there's also a little cavity in the belly, in the abdomen, which would have originally most likely been filled with um, medicinal or magical substances. Now, these objects that I've just shown you would have been commissioned by Troque leaders from professional sculptors who were held in high esteem and would have worked exclusively in service of these chiefs. Um, among the Troque, much like among the Lulua, we see a distinction between works made by professional artists with, which are executed with exacting features and more abstracted forms which were produced by non-specialists, most likely by religious specialists or ritual specialists, and these objects were used in ritual, ritual contexts. It is, uh, according to Marie-Louise Bastin, the Belgian art historian that I mentioned to you earlier, which passed away in 2000, and uh, she's the one who is generally considered the mother of Chokwe art studies, um, to whom all of us refer uh, when writing or talking about the Chokwe people. Um, so she has proposed that these chiefly figures, um, like the ones that I've shown you from Berlin and from the Kimball and from um, uh, Porto, um, that they uh, most likely developed in the homeland of the Chokwe people in central Angola during the late 18th or even the early 19th century. Now, it's also obvious given the matrilineal system of succession and inheritance, the important role of women as mothers, but also as advisors in, in the social and political sphere, that you will find female images represented in Chokwe art, although they're surprisingly more limited than male figures. This is a very rare example of a combination of men and, and, and uh, uh, male and female. Um, some have even um, uh, proposed that the male figure here on the right would be a representation of Chibinda Ilunga, and this was, would be the image of his wife as she appears in the epic myth that I recounted briefly to you earlier, a princess known as Luigi. Um, but that's an interpretation that is not generally accepted. Um, among the most spectacular examples of female images are the two that are included in the exhibition. This is um, supposedly the representation of a, ch a chief's first wife, known as Namata, uh, collected again in the late 19th century and in the Museum of Berlin. And then the other one is this female figure called Mukwakuhiko, the youngest wife of a polygynous, polygamous Chokwe chief who would be responsible for uh, the preparation of his food. Um, and this is what this image with these two bowls would uh, refer to. Now let's go back briefly to this uh, female image of the chief's first wife. Um, here, of course, striking is the animation, uh, which is rendered through the gesture of the hands, but also the bent knees, and of course, this very impressive hairdo uh, with um, uh, locks and uh, made out of uh, real human hair. And the same is actually true for this object where you find um, real hair of individual tresses that are matted with clay, and then other features that are very um, accurate in the way they're rendered, the file teeth, uh, and a variety of um, anatomical details, details included the representation of exposed labia. In all these cases, what you see are adult women, mature women, um, who have undergone the transformation from childhood to um, adulthood. Now, um, much has been written about the meaning and the identity of, of these figures, female and male figures, Mukwakuhiko, Namata, Chibinda Ilunga, a chief, Manangana, but the function of these figures um, is actually very poorly understood. The fact is that we have no or very little first-hand contextual information. It is again Marie-Louise Bastin, um, the woman whose picture I showed you, a little bit earlier here, who is responsible for the basic distinction which we generally make in Chokwe art between court art or courtly art and folk art. Um, and the distinction would re um, reflect important contextual differences. Court art would be made by professional artists, would have predominantly political functions, while folk art would be made by ritual specialists and would have very strong religious connotations. Following this classification, all these masterpieces that I've shown you so far obviously belong to the court art category, which, as I said, could be as early as the late 18th century. Now, the category of folk art um, includes much more simple, abstract, symbolical types of works that actually rarely include sculptural 
carvings. This is one of the very rare examples that has been preserved and is today in a private collection in Belgium. Um, and it's interesting to note that this term, hamba, um, is in fact an equivalent of what the Lulua people call Bwanga and the Songye and other people call Nkishi. It is a power object. Um, although it has many other related meanings. Most of these power objects, like Jinga, for instance, have to do with hunting or ensuring and protecting fertility and a safe childbirth. In this case, it's hunting. It's actually a small object that is worn, you see, six centimeters high, that is worn as a protective amulet or pendant around uh, the neck. Um, okay, so. Now, when it comes to these uh, chiefly figures, male or female, um, a number of different propositions have been made about what they could have been used for, what their purpose would have been. Uh, typically, people will talk about them as being commemorative um, images, um, and that's uh, one possibility. It's also been uh, said that they are generic representations of founding ancestors, in this case, a couple of male and female, that they are visual glorifications of ancestorship and filiation, that they served as role models, um, that they were used during ceremonies and other activities, or that they would have been part of palace treasuries where they were under the care of ritual experts. Now, all of these interpretations may be true and valid, but what I've thought is that, and I presented that hypothesis, that's what it is, in a catalog called Art and Power in the Central Savannah, which was published in conjunction with an exhibition at the Cleveland Museum of Art in 2008. And I came to this conclusion, and I'll tell you what it is, um, based on, an, on a reading of the literature, including Marie-Louise Bastin's many writings, and the visual evidence provided by some of the objects themselves. And what I'm proposing is that some of these chiefly figures representing Chibina Ilunga or normal chiefs should be understood as power objects, as mahamba, that's the plural of um, hamba, and that they actually contained medicinal and magical substances just like the Buanga objects among the Luluwad and Kishi among the Songye, and that they served as intermediaries between this world and the other world. Um, and in fact, if you look at the literature um, and you look at collections, you see that this whole distinction between symbolical, roughly made um, uh, mahamba power objects and, and refined um, objects that belong to the court art category should not be taken as literally. This is an example of a hamba called Hamba Wachisola, um, which is now in the Tervuren Museum, which obviously um, you know, shows refinement in its details and its accoutrements with a very um, impressive feather hairdo being represented and all kinds of accessories that dress up the figure and that imitate both in the cicatrizations and the dress that imitate real dress and real body makeup. Another example would be this object where you see that um, inserted into the head are these two little antelope horns that are filled with these substances that denote uh, power objects among many other peoples and obviously also among the uh, Chokwin. This object was actually also collected explicitly as a hamba. So in fact, Marie-Louise Marie Bastin herself has said that some of these authentic hamba figures uh, are the work of professional artists and are indeed meticulously and carefully carved. And then she also says that some objects that belong to this chiefly or courtly art category um, actually um, uh, show traits and elements that prove that they were charged with substances, and in other words, that they were used in a ritual or um, religious context. And specifically referring to this figure of Chibinga Ilunga, I already pointed out the cavity in the belly that would have contained substances, but there's also the fact that there's this tubular extension on the head, which typically is hollowed out, or at least is pierced, and according to Bastin, it would have um, possibly contained a horn filled with substances very similar to what you see on this little figure. Um, the same attribute is seen on this object where there is actually a piercing. And then, of course, in this case, you have this um, antelope horn which is actually hollowed out and, and still shows traces of substances that were preserved in it. Um, very interesting is, is this figure, not in the exhibition, but in the Linden Museum in Stuttgart, where you have a seated chief 
on these uh, folding chairs, similar to the two magnificent examples in the exhibition, he wears a European hat in which a little antelope horn is stuck, again, filled with substances. And then this, what he's doing here is he's preparing a pinch of snuff in a gesture that denotes a sign of welcoming to a visitor, and is very similar to the clapping gesture that you see in some of the other seated um, Chokwe figures. It's also interesting to know that in a, instead of a horn, some objects show what you see here, a lance or a spear in iron that, exu that, that extends from that tubular extension on the head. Um, and this is actually the only figure that I know of that shows a chief with a typical tachi gesture, the, the, the impressive hairdo, um, and then um, uh, extending out of that tubular projection this spear or lance. It's interesting that he stands on a separately carved pedestal, a sort of throne, um, and most likely this object, you still see the peg here, um, had the same function, was also originally placed on a throne like this one, and most likely given the fact that it has the same tubular extension also held the spear or lance. Um, the, the similar iron spear, um, which also, of course, refers to the hunt um, as, as a hunting tool, um, we see in a number of other objects, but they're very limited. One is this scepter with a metal spear coming out of it. The other one, a wooden female figure, actually, with a wooden replica of a spear inserted in the top of the head. Bo both are um, in another public collection in Lisbon, the Sociedade de Geografia. Um, Okay. Charged with magical and medicinal substances and the focus of ritual attention as expressed in traces of oils and other ointments on the sculpture's surfaces, um, the question arises if such Chibinda Ilunga and other chiefly figures were specifically part of a category of so-called ancient or ancestral Mahamba, which were exclusively owned by the chief or lord of the land, the Monangana, the highest ranking Chokwe leader, um, who, as the protector of fertility and the well-being of the land and its inhabitants, combined social, political, and economic authority with important ritual and religious powers. As such, these sculptures may have played a role in the chief's investiture and also um, may be tied to the building of the chiefly enclosure or fence, which until um, recently, this fence or enclosure contained a sacred area where the chief um, um, uh, gathered and uh, preserved his power objects. Um, and so it's likely that these chiefly images were part of this chiefly treasure or chiefly ensemble meant to safeguard the chief's authority and power and by extension the, the, the well-being of his uh, people. And obviously what you see in this uh, particular image is um, this spear-like wooden object called a mbunji stake next to a tree identified as uh, a muyombo tree, um, or at least the whole, the whole ensemble is called muyombo, the trees of a species called mukumbi. Um, and that is like the center part of the chiefly enclosure where um, the, the chief will invoke and pray to his ancestral spirits and, and his ancestors. Um, and, and so you'll find it in every um, a chiefly um, residence, in this case among Luvale people, neighbors of the Chokwe in Zambia, whose culture is actually very, very similar in many ways with the same terminology as the Chokwe. And so I think I have two minutes left. And in those two minutes, I'd like to say a few words about Chokwe masks, and I probably have to skip a few pages here, but um, the exhibition includes these fabulous examples of female masks, generally known as Moana Puo or Puo, young woman or woman, which are typically known as dance masks, and it is believed that these masks would uh, be of a little more recent in fabrication, that they would have been made or created uh, sometime in the 20th century, and at the time that Chokwe artists and peoples um, emigrated to neighboring uh, parts of the Congo in Zambia. All these masks, again, portray an ideal of womanhood in the rendering of facial marks and also and especially in the very elaborate hairdos, headdresses that imitate real headdresses. And then there's other features like earrings, a little bamboo stick that is worn uh, through the septum, and also a general um, emphasis on realism with ears, in this case, carved separately out of or made separately out of leather and attached to the wooden face. 
Of course, in their real context, these masks were worn along with a, a bodysuit uh, made out of uh, knotted fibers that would cover the uh, whole body of the dancer, and it would always be a man who would wear these kind of masks, even those that portray ideally idealized female beauty. You have many variations in the exhibition that show regional um, styles, most likely, that can be attributed to particular regions or areas, and maybe even to artists. Um, now, here, interestingly enough, the mask also sometimes receives a proper name, and what is more interesting even is, is that some of them have been identified as being portraits or at least half-portraits, where an artist uh, literally chooses a female individual renowned for her beauty and appeal in the community as a model from which to work and from which to uh, create these masks. Now, the interesting thing in relation to what I just mentioned with regard to the chiefly figure is that these kind of masks, in addition to being dance masks that portray ideal feminine beauty and tasks, are also mahamba at times, are also power objects, that they are actually the focus of worship and prayers, and that they can cause harm, especially to their wearer or to somebody of his close family if they're not treated properly. And that's true for Mwana Puo, but even more for the male version of this mask, Chihongo, which actually represents um, the, the, the spirit of strength and wealth and embodies traits that are admired in leaders. And these masks exist both in a wooden version and in a, a fabric and twig version like this example. Um, so these masks, the Chihongo mask, which was only own, worn by the son of a chief, was believed to be able to cause infertility, sickness, or bad luck in, hunt, in hunting, if not honored properly. Um, he, it would be worn by the chief himself when um, a sacrifice was needed in order to appease the mask that felt neglected and liberate the community from its wrath. And not, when not in use, the Chihongo was actually preserved in a little ancestral shrine along with other personal power objects or mahamba, and that's when it receives the name Hamba wa Chihongo. And if you look carefully, here you see a Chihongo mask similar to the one that I showed you here. And then there's another mask that is even closer related to the chiefly figures that I showed you. It's called Chikungu, and that's much uh, harder to find in collections. I think there's actually only two that we know of in the Museo de Dodundo in Angola. They are never made out of wood, and they appear very, very rarely only, um, and they are only worn by the Monangana himself, the lord of the land. They're surrounded by the greatest secrecy, um, and therefore they have also barely been seen by outside. Um, now, I'll try to conclude in one minute, and that is by saying that um, it is believed that the European colonization contributed to the decline of the autonomy and authority of Chokwe chiefs, um, and the same happened apparently among the Lulua, and that they indirectly, the colonization also contributed to the demise of the figurative tradition that celebrated them. Um, it is believed that these masks uh, were a new form of artistic expression um, and that they expressed a more enduring uh, um, ideal and very often were much more related to specific individuals that were commemorated through these objects rather than legendary culture heroes. Um, it should be said, however, that uh, masks, their use and their appearance is documented in 19th century publications and there are reasons to believe that both Puo masks and Chihongo masks are actually um, as old as these 19th or late 18th century Chibinda uh, and figures and, and uh, chiefly figures. Um, we should just keep in mind that um, in the end the the the, the creation date suggested by Bastin and others in her footstep remain tentative. Um, the fact is that we have at best late 19th century acquisition dates, but that they in and by themselves do not necessarily confirm the actual date of manufacture of an object. Um, then we, Bastin and others have also identified stylistic trends or currents in the Chokwe uh, sculptural um, legacy, but these point to stylistic trends and are at best related to geographic references, but in them by themselves, again, cannot confirm a time of manufacture. 
Um, the fact is that uh, very few objects um, have been acquired with specific information about their place of origin or creation in Africa when it comes to these chokwe objects, even those acquired in the late 19th century. In fact, we know that because of the mobility of chokwe people uh, as traders and hunters, that their material culture traveled along with them. And we know of some objects, at least, that they were dispersed over great distances. And then finally, and that's really the last word, we should also keep in mind that collections, as we know them, public and private, are fragmentary and incomplete, that they don't contain everything that has ever been made, that they, among other things, reveal the preferences, interests, and biases of those who established and assembled these uh, collections. And in saying that, it's obvious that uh, many objects were never actually acquired or rarely acquired, and that goes among other things for objects that were very fragile in nature in terms of the materials that were used to make them, such as the masks that I've shown you here, also for objects that were non-figurative and that were therefore aesthetically not considered interesting from a Western point of view, from a museum or collector's point of view. And of course, there's also the truth that uh, many objects were considered so powerful that they were not collected, that were never shown, and therefore never given away and never collected. The last thing that one should keep in mind here is that um, the limited knowledge that we have about the, the, the exact meaning of these sculptures and also about the makers, the names of the makers of these sculptures, ultimately can be explained when one accepts the notion that objects like the masks and the figures that I show you are ultimately in the first place power objects, objects that contain medicinal substances and that serve as communicators and mediators with the other world, and that for the Chokwe people, like for their Luba and Lulua neighbors, it's much more important to, to, to know what an object actually did or accomplished rather than what it was or what it represented. Thank you. Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon, and we hope to see you back January 29th for our dialogue on oral history.